super fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here in the Benson Amps shop in lovely Portland, Oregon with the namesake man himself, Chris. And we're just uh, talking about whatever. <laughs> As it is, when we get together, the conversation ranges from from guitar stuff to life stuff to, you know, um, weird combinations of wild animals that we could dream up for, mm -hmm. to then base more gear off of. <laughs> Maybe the best thing, I think like the best thing about our relationship over the years is maybe two or three times a year we'll have a super intense late night text session where we're just spitballing uh, really coming up with the name of a piece of gear first and then deciding what it is based on based on that we still haven't made the Cerberus yeah yeah Cerberus Cerberus yeah we shouldn't give too much away about that though no that's some proprietary stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah. World's changing. It's, it's, gonna, <laughs> it's definitely going to be different. Your job is interesting because you have like this stuff's got to get done around here. And, and yet there's an aspect of it that's sort of like you got to go hang out like late and go to shows uh -huh. and meet people coming through. And, you know, and still you have to manage this whole world happening here. Yep. It's like, uh, it's weird. it demands two different lifestyles. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky in that I only have to put on my big boy pants like a couple times a week uh -huh. and make some key decisions, but mm -hmm. um, the day-to-day -day of the shop is, like, I don't know, like, who Sam that is, for mm -hmm. instance, or... That's a, cool. A, a, like, if basically what my job now is, like do the heavy lifting with tech stuff like if there's like a really a technical problem that you know my guys can't solve like or a, or just like a a way to put together cabinets or something mm -hmm. like I, I have to step in but my day to day is usually just like writing emails and uh, going to shows <laughs> <laughs> and designing new products and uh, a lot of graphic design stuff so yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty weird. It's pretty different than did, like even a year ago. Did you ever imagine it would look like this? No, no, I didn't. I didn't think I'd it would ever get this big. I th I thought I would pretty much just be making you know four or five amps a month in my garage for the rest of my life, <laughs> and literally wouldn't see another person. Yeah, no, I, I had no no idea that it would get this big. I think there's something cool, though, that uh, working with people like this and having a shop space, there's obviously interesting stories going on and the relational aspect of it. And I don't you know, if you, if you didn't have this shop, certain people wouldn't come in and out of your life. And it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, the the weirdest thing for me with that is, you know, I've never wanted to be a boss, like, in charge of people, <laughs> right. like, ever. Like, I'm, I'm kind of an anarchist in, in a lot of ways. I, just, I think it's funny when people are defiant. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then I'm, all of a sudden I'm thrust into this position where I actually have to, you know, deal with like HR type uh -huh. stuff and like personalities and right. realize that there's like a weird, there could be a weird power dynamic, but still, I guess, try to be cool. I don't know. How do you, how do you deal with that? I don't know. Do you have a philosophy for... I mean, I'm pretty, pretty hands off and I, I don't know if I've just gotten really lucky with people, but my crew is just amazing. Um, and they're, you know, every once in a while they'll be, someone will be, you know, messing something up consistently. It's like, hey, you know, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, I just kind of leave them alone and, you know, they seem happy, I guess. <laughs> it seems like, uh, like starting a band almost or, or playing music where, uh, 
maybe you, you just run into someone and identify that they're cool and you want to hang out with them or they're a good person, responsible or something, and then you bring them into the fold of like, you should join our band, you know, you should work at Benson Amps. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't even go that far. Like, I'm not skilled with headhunting or uh-huh. p- putting together a group of people. Like, it's, it seems like it was literally just luck or like the right people found me. Um, I've just been incredibly lucky. That's right. With it. But it, it has not really been like, like, take like Alex, for instance. You mm-hmm. know, Alex was like a longtime customer. And I've actually, I used to call him up to go on like road trips to Sacramento or, wherever they were just like buddies and he's like at one point he's just like hey you know I'd, I'd like to you know work mm. a little bit you know I've, I've got a couple like I've got good carpentry skills maybe I could assemble cabinets and I think that's pretty much the extent of what I've ever talked to Alex about this job mm. <laughs> that like that's that's as far as it went like mm. he's just kind of done that ever since and like I'll we'll have to put our heads together and figure out like, you know, how to do something every once in a while, but he just kind of lets us know how much he's worked and we pay him. What, what's the hardest thing about having this business? Probably just not a ton of security in the market, mm. but that's probably hard with any business. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen to the demand of my amplifiers. Uh, and there's not a great precedent set by everyone else. I mean, you see amp companies fail all the time. Uh, companies bigger right. than mine, or at one point they were more successful. And just not really having the guarantee um, that it's going to work. Yeah. Like, we're not... Like, there's a company across the street that sells brooms. <laughs> and th- the demand for, like, a good solid broom probably isn't going to go away anytime. Right. Um, but the demand for, like, a fancy amplifier using, uh, like, weird parts made in America, mm-hmm. like, you, th- that's really volatile. I mean, this year has been really bad for a bunch of different businesses and guitar makers and amp makers mm. and we've managed to miss most of it for whatever reason but you know that could be us next year yeah so i'm i'm kind of always ready to dial back our production if if we even get a hint of a hint that that's going to happen cuz and i'm not a business guy you know i studied poetry in college um, I've never worked in retail, uh, and I'm pretty much just a musician, so to actually have to think about market forces and um, what kind of, kind of try to uh, see into the future a little bit. Yeah, sounds it's like been, a tightrope. It's, it's been weird. Mm-hmm. Um, so far, you know, it's going okay, but that can shift at any time. Mm. So that's probably the hardest thing, just... Mm, try, trying to know what to do. Right. Going on some kind of gut <laughs> feeling for like the next right step. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the broom industry took a hit when the Roomba became a thing. <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> a good question. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Last night we were... Um, we got into a whole conversation about uh, the amount of marketing mojo that exists in the gear world. Yeah. And maybe <clears throat> maybe most in the guitar world, more in the guitar world than like any other uh, any other musical gear market. Second being probably recording. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I don't think drummers like go for. I mean, there's vintage drums and all that kind of stuff, but like secret tone dust mojo doesn't really. That concept isn't really in the drum world as much, or bass players are a little more practical than that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
but in the guitar world there's this just insane uh, fixation with gear and who played what and guitar players are more like cats anyways too you know <laughs> they're, they're kind of standoffish and you know uh, may want to be petted may not want to be petted and uh, you're you're not uh, very secretive or you're you're not necessarily cultivating a mystique mm-hmm. about what you do no which I think is honorable I, I believe in in the sharing of information uh, that only that only helps and increases community. Um, is that is that like a conscious decision for you, or uh, and what do you and what do you think about stuff that comes along that is like coveted tone, uh, fairy dust, magic goop? I mean, at the end of the day, with that stuff, I mean it's the same reason I don't tell lies. Uh huh. Um, not not that it wouldn't necessarily well other than the whole moral <laughs> thing <laughs> that yeah um, it's just easier to tell the truth and be honest mm. about what something is and what it does and you know if, if I had to keep like a bunch of bullshit about capacitors that I've told people over the years that may or may not be true mm. or have any grounding and facts in my head like that would be that would suck. Right. And I would just, I don't know. Like, I basically, I just believe in being straightforward and telling the truth. I mean, there is, there are things that have mojo. Though, like, there are capacitors that sound really good. Mm-hmm. And that's what I use. But in terms of just, like, I, I feel like that mystique comes at the expense of, like, like there's an expense to it, mm-hmm. I guess. Have you ever played a dumble? <laughs> no, I haven't. So I, you know, I don't really know. Right, right. Um, but you know, I've seen Dumble's circuits and I've seen the clones and whatnot. And they're, it's cool. Um, it's not my thing, but I think uh, the important thing about Dumble is just kind of a case study in cultivating that kind of mystique mm-hmm. and. Like, what is this, like, weird psychological attraction guitar guitarists feel to uh, going after this thing that's, you know, unattainable and will probably right. let you down if you actually find it. Right. The, like, divorce of reality, like, the actual real value of something from the perceived value of something is so crazy to me it, the thing is like it works on me too mm-hmm. I mean I've been inside you know Uber boutique not boutique maybe just like th- these like famous amps that everyone's kind of going after you know made by the this one guy in a mountaintop in <laughs> Colorado or whatever um, and there's usually nothing special to it mm-hmm. like I, a lot of times I'll look into it like oh man, you know, these are really highly regarded. And then I take it apart, hoping that I'm going to you know, learn something, because mm-hmm. that's how you learn how to make amps. Mm-hmm. That's how you learn about circuitry. You just kind of see what works. Mm-hmm. And then I get to the end of it, I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't learn a, I didn't learn a thing. It doesn't even sound that good. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's been really weird, like kind of interfacing with that whole culture is it being being a musician uh has becoming a builder of gear changed how you relate to it did you have like one view of it when you were just a player and now i guess i'm asking is it demystified in some way or oh yeah yeah it's 100 percent demystified <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's a uh, th- there aren't any secrets mm-hmm. I mean, Transformers are kind of the final frontier for me. Um, That's interesting. And But the most people can say about Transformers is that they sound different. Right. For some reason. And you can't really quantify any of it. And, you know, I use the Transformers that I think sound the best, which are Mercury. And most vintage iron actually doesn't sound that good to me. Mm. 
Is there so. something that people think they're hearing when they listen to vintage components like that, or? I don't know. I mean, most of the vintage stuff that's around and is is in use is usually pretty messed up in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Like, a, a lot of times someone will bring in this Fender that they, they really love, and they're like, listen to that tone, and you know, it's like the fourth one I've seen that week. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you know, this is like well, the, the worst of the four. Like, there's something wrong with your amp. Like, we, we have to fix this. It's, it could sound a lot better. Mm. But, and, the, and they don't even know because what they're, they, they're kind of hearing with their eyes and they're hearing what they want right. to hear. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm continually uh, surprised at my own ability to deceive myself when it comes to sound. Oh, yeah. You know? Uh, Me too. Because there's, there's like, I've experienced that with like records that I used to listen to all the time and then I haven't listened to for five or six years and it's become it's become some other thing in my head and when I hear it again it's like man that doesn't sound anything like I thought it did or mm -hmm. what my mental image of it was or even guitars or amps or drums that I love for a season and then for the next season I just can't even relate to it sort of man this thing doesn't do anything for me and then you come back to it a couple of months later and it's like wow this is the coolest guitar ever made which I don't think that the gear is changing sometimes the gear is changing sometimes you need new tubes or something but uh, most of it is just is me and my perceptions moving around yeah I mean once something's demystified for me I don't have that kind of relationship with it anymore mm -hmm. I, I can look at it objectively which is a major driving force in learning you mm -hmm. know you know there's this like magic pedal like okay well no it's not magic yeah um, and I can tell you why it sounds the way it sounds if I could see the circuit mm -hmm. and I might learn something but like it, it'll still be demystified right and I'm not gonna it'll just kind of be like it's not going to be you know special in terms of how should I say this is that uh, is that disappointing or is it liberating it's totally liberating okay. because then you can actually figure out what actually sounds good mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're not just kind of a slave to uh mystique right um and what gurus will tell you and what you know you, you, you can basically just kind of start thinking and hearing for yourself yeah. which is cool. really nice it's also the really nice thing about like designing a new product because you're not trying to necessarily make it sound like anything you're trying to get something that sounds good um so yeah does that make sense absolutely yeah who's your favorite guitar player <laughs> <laughs> you are <didn't> <laughs> yes <laughs> I don't know is there anyone that makes you uh, when you hear them that makes you like uh, jealous for for what they have going on in a positive way yeah I mean there's so many most most people who actually pick up a guitar, that's how I feel. Mm. Like, oh man, that was really cool. I want to learn how to do that. Um, but in terms of like just someone I'll put on to listen to their guitar playing, honestly, I'm more of a songwriter. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll, I have like favorite songwriters, but I don't really think about guitarists that much. Mm. I think about producers and production. Oh, interesting. And I think about drummers probably more than I think about guitarists. Who's your drumming spirit animal? <laughs> Mitch Mitchell. Yeah. I love Mitch Mitchell. Mm. Um, I love some of the drummers that, you know, we've played with over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Manson, James McAllister. Yeah. Um, Shout out to James. Yeah. Peter. Yep. <laughs> um, you're one of my favorite drummers. Thanks, brother. Can I get it? I'm going to get can I get some more coffee? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I am admittedly like a guitar nerd. 
you know, like I was listening, there's a podcast called um, No Guitar is Safe. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll, I mean, they, they have all kinds of guitar players on there. The last one I was listening to on the way over here is Joe Satriani. I like Joe Satriani just fine and respect his thing. I don't listen to his music all the time, but I will absolutely listen to him talk about the guitar. Mm-hmm. Partly because I, I am fascinated by people who uh, get so into the details of what they do, you know, in a real craft kind of way. Like, I think the thing I realized for myself that, that matters to me in, like, playing and tone and recording and production is nuance. Like, that's what where, like, the character and personality is, you know? Mm-hmm. So people who cultivate that and dial into it and, and spend time on, like, the nuance of what they're doing. I'll, I'll listen to people talk about that all day long, you know, whether I relate to the music or not. Yeah, I think favorite guitar player can't really be separated from, like, what somebody does inside of the music that they're playing. Mm-hmm. Like, even Bill Frizzell who is uh, you know, one of my favorites and like one of the like living legend category of, of players out there. Uh, he's so good because of how he moves, I think, inside of the music. Mm-hmm. And when you hear him play with singer-songwriters, you understand just like how musical he is, his taste and restraint and, uh, and all that kind of stuff, while still sounding like, like him, you know? Who's, who is the, that kind of person for you where you listen to what they do in the context of a song and you just go, oh, that's so good? Um, yeah, I think that's a better, better question. Yeah. Who's your favorite guitarist? <laughs> right, yeah. uh, for me, definitely. Um, I, in terms of a guitar player who plays musically you know, inside of a song and, and will just move it along and do the perfect thing, I mean... I have great respect for like Mike Campbell mm-hmm. and Tom Petty. Um, Robbie Robertson he plays all sorts of like weird, bizarre stuff that would probably sound annoying <laughs> outside the context of the band. Right. You know. Yeah. Uh, he he, but he always seems to kind of find the the perfect thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the perfect thing is weird to because the perfect thing can be like totally not what you would expect. Mm-hmm. You know, perfect thing is often something that's just out enough to catch your attention. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably more into like, way more into just someone who uses the guitar as like a horn mm-hmm. or something like that, where it's like, you know, it it plays a line, like it's not like a super fast solo or something, but it just does the perfect thing with the perfect tone to kind of propel it forward mm-hmm. and build intrigue so yeah I don't you know I'm just, uh, I'm arguably a songwriter more than I am a guitarist I'm arguably more of a drummer than I am a guitarist <laughs> well <laughs> for, for what it's worth I, I have a great affection and, and some envy for your lead playing thanks I don't think that's like guitar ability I think it's just music yeah no it's musical uh it, it's musical, and there there are certain things that you do that would never occur to me, in the in the like, in the heat of battle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I, I love it, you know. I, I hear it and go like, oh man, I, I I gotta try to absorb a little bit of that into what I do. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm like a. I don't I don't play that well, but. I feel like it's it's more just like thinking about what the song needs. Mm-hmm. Like I'm totally song driven. I mean, I'm about that with the amps. Like I'm not into right, making right. like an amp for. Yeah, I like Joe Satriani too, but I'm not trying to make something that Joe would like. I'm, I'm trying to make something that a guitar player playing in a band, supporting a song, mm. um, is is gonna like. You know, something that will just take up the perfect frequency range and just sound sweet and just Mm -hmm. try to get every ounce of just kind of sensitivity yeah um out of out of that instrument no no creamy soaring leads (laughs) not not into the creamy tones yeah so much 
um, yeah, I guess they're uh, people have described them as songwriter amps, mm. um, and that makes sense. Yeah, I could see that. I, I think too, uh, they're they're amps that really reward the pursuit of nuance. Because mm-hmm. I I sort of went from when we first met, uh, I was in a phase of like playing lower powered amps, you know, and kind of that more old school combination of like very mid focused pickups, like a Telecaster kind of vibe or uh, like like the Les Paul that I sold you and into a lower powered amp because I was doing a lot of recording and that works really well on, you know, put a mic on a small amp and you've got a really cool sound that fits into a track. But those aren't necessarily uh, the most nuance rich <laughs> uh, signal chains. You know, they sort of have many stages of absorption of like the transient response and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, and not that Benson amps are not capable of those kind of vibes, but for me, I think starting to play the Monarch when I got it, um, uh, it affected my playing over the like next several years to where I started getting into more uh, nuance of like, I, st- I stopped playing with a pick, started playing just with my fingers and fingernails because um, because of the way the amp responded, I had access to this kind of like a wider mm-hmm. range of, of color, um, which then, you know, as, as time went on, it was like, uh, oh, I, I started wanting a little more power and more headroom, which is why the Chimera is awesome for me because all of a sudden, um, rather than kind of like corralling character like some vintage amps and vintage speakers do, uh, it's like the character is magnified and amplified. Everything that I'm playing is kind of uh, being put on like a big screen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a little, it's, it's a little terrifying at first, especially yeah. if you come from, a, you know, like playing a telly into a like tweed champ or something like that. Um, yeah, the Chimera is uh, kind of terrifying to play, especially right. with one of those Ronin guitars. Yeah. And it's just like, everything is kind of amplified. Oh yeah, it's... it's All the feels. <laughs> it's nerve-wracking. <laughs> every, every gesture is a, you know, broadcast. Yeah. Um, I still remember the first time we plugged a Marari into the Chimera that I uh-huh. built for them. And we're all just like, what the heck? Yeah, yeah. We were, we were at that studio and I think we, we all took turns playing for like, for like an hour or two of just that. And I, I kind of remember like being in a daze afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. It was sh- sheer volume and, and also just like the complexity of the sound. That's kind of what I get out of out of these amps. Is this? Uh, I feel like it magnifies my personality uh, a lot, uh, a lot more. Sometimes it's it's fun to plug into something else that's just like brown and round and sure and squishy. But yeah, I've got a I've got a stable of the <laughs> of the of those. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But so yeah, I mean, I think songwriter amps is is true, but but also. Uh, uh, people who are looking for for nuance and personality and something that, that is outside the realm of just this is a clone of a tweed circuit or this oh, yeah. is a you know clone of a Vox circuit. Yeah. I mean the the whole kind of experiment with the monarch is to try to get as much sensitivity and personality to shine through as possible. I mean that's that's always been the goal. It's things got two knobs. Right. Like how how much can I make it do with almost no control? But yeah, but it's <laughs> other than the fingers. Uh, but but it's not like playing a, a Roland jazz chorus or something. It's it's got compression and vibe, and it, it's a uh, there's a lot of personality that comes through, but it doesn't leave you hanging <laughs> in terms of, uh, of of tone. Yeah, it's a it's an achievement. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, a lot of that was actually inspired by playing in bands with you, back in the day. Nice. Just how carefully you'd listen to stuff and remember that tone we got with uh, 
I think you're you owed Les Paul mm -hmm. into that divided by thirteen. Yeah. We cranked all the way up in the studio. That was like pretty formative to uh. what I wanted an amp to be able to do. Yeah. That was a cool amp. I still I still think about that amp on occasion. Yeah. I mean I didn't didn't love the cleans on it, mm -hmm. but turned all the way up, it was just like blistering. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the divided by thirteen was like the first modern amp. Uh like that every like I previously had uh, like Mesa Boogies and uh, <laughs> this is like Dirty Laundry uh, <laughs> uh, I had I had some like Rivera amps back in the day um, uh, but I got that divided by 13 and it was kind of eye opening because it was that thing of like even just barely on everything but that amp had a lot of torque I felt like as soon as you started to play something, it would jump up and just bark, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I had never played anything with that kind of immediacy to it. Yeah, it was a really cool amp. I remember tracing that circuit <laughs> a couple of years after that session mm -hmm. and just kind of see, to, to see, you know, what part of the circuit design made it do that. Mm. I think... It, I took it in for a pair for yeah, yeah. at one point. It was like, okay, I'm going to see what this thing is. It's like, man, this thing is different. And they brightened it in like 13 different ways. <laughs> it's just like a, the amp equivalent of like a treble booster. Right. Uh, which is why it sounds so good when you dime it. Hmm. The basic shape of the Monarch, you know, the head and cabinet, the mini stack, was definitely inspired by that, that amp. Mm. I don't think I knew, by I knew how much of an impact that had. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, it was the only boutique amp I had ever played at that point. Mm. I was like, man, this thing sounds magical. You know, this doesn't sound like a the Fender Hot Rod <laughs> Deluxe that I thought sounded amazing when right. I was 20, 22. It's like, eh, this is the best amp in the world. It looks so classy. And I'm like, mm. you know, I, I've worked on probably a thousand of those at this point. Mm -hmm. And they all have the same problems with this, you know, computer green, you know, circuit board on the inside. Uh -huh. That's been very dem demystified <laughs> for me. <laughs> the mass production amps. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. I have my favorites, for sure. Like, I, I actually still think the Hot Rod Deluxe is a great amp in mm -hmm. some ways. Um, I like the Pro Junior. Pro Those Junior's cool. great. I, I can't play Blues Juniors at all. Mm -hmm. I like the modern Supros actually sound pretty good. I like them. Yeah, there's, there's good stuff that's that's being made and mass produced for sure. It's like a golden age of guitar gear right now. It's kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like which of the 20 manufacturers who are making tone bender clones do you <laughs> choose from, you know? <laughs> Uh, I just I would just make my own. Yeah, you would. <laughs> you would. This conversation has taken its course, you know. So. Uh, yeah, we're just kind of rambling now. Yeah, yeah. Which is you know, I listen to people ramble all the time. That's like what our current podcast age is yeah. all about. And on that note, thanks for joining me. By the way, my tech mat is making a, a bias probe called the Cerberus. Really? It's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's not annoying. That is. That's unfortunate. Yeah. yeah you same. should slap him with a cease and desist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just hand it to him personally leave one it, day. Leave it on his bench. Yeah. <laughs> it's super passive aggressive. <laughs> Maybe send it to an email that he hasn't used for four or five years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh hey man, did did you get my email? Oh, you might want to check your spam folder. <laughs> Anyways, Classy. have a great night. Yeah. <laughs> Passive aggressive bossing. <laughs> this is a new web series. People can find that stuff all over the place, but just to have chats, you know. Heart to heart. Heart tone, to heart. Tone chats. Tone chats. <laughs> Yeah. That'd be a funny name for a series. There you go, Tone Chats. T
tone chats with Dan Phelps. It's expensive.